You are Locked On Dodgers Postcast. Part of Locked On Los Angeles on the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. The Locked On Dodgers Postcast on the Locked On Sports LA YouTube channel, the place to hang out when every game is done. And you can listen to us on the Locked On Dodgers Podcast feed. I am Pete Fox, joined by the one and only Jeff Snyder. Jeff, uh, I thank you for your editing skills because I'm terrible at that. I'm trying to rush. I see you sitting there. I'm like, oh no, he's waiting. He's waiting. And I'm like, yeah, type it, it, mad man. If our viewers notice that everything's spelled right over on the right, you can thank me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, our producer, Sam, is always busting my balls about that. He's like, yeah, the editor in me uh, notices that you spelled James Hart wrong you spelled otani wrong i'm like all right i'll get it don't worry don't worry don't worry when I'm rushing, players you're uh, talking about no big whoop <laughs> when i'm rushing i'm i'm not a very good typer i did i think i took typing in high school but I, if i did i don't remember it all that well so um uh we're here to talk about the dodgers uh i'm excited because jeff is joining me and this is the first time i'm doing this uh tandem split screen sort of thing it's it's usually just me and my bobbleheads which by the way, Jeff, do not compare to yours. Like you can see mine right above my head there. I've got about eight or nine. You've got about 80 or 90. Nice job there. Yeah. Last time I counted, it was like 103, but uh, yeah, that, that's been a while ago. So I, I haven't counted lately. Well, uh, the reason I wanted you to come on for two specific things, uh, Dodgers with a 4-1 win at Wrigley against the Cubs today to snap that one game losing streak. Um, but when we first met uh, in a chat, we talked about a few things that I think our opinions differ on, and uh, I wanted to get into that. First and foremost, uh, the performance from Yamamoto today I thought was very, very good. Uh, he had the curveball working. The fastball was a little bit off, but more than anything, he was pulled by Dave Roberts and whoever, the coaching staff or the the powers that be, you know, that sit there on a computer and watch this game and decide when it's time to pull the starting pitcher. He had 80, was it 80 pitches? Yeah. But more than anything, he had retired 10 in a row. I'm thinking, really? Let's let, I mean, it's not like there was a no hitter working or anything, but I mean, he was rolling. I mean, are you okay with that, that yank at that point? Or do you think that he could have had a little bit more juice? Or are you of the mindset that, all right, I'm going to go with the analytics and I, I believe that they know what they're doing? You know, it's some combination of all those things that I'm I'm mostly OK with it for, for a few reasons. Um, you know, the Dodgers did a bullpen game to give Yamamoto an extra day off. I I don't know for sure if they're doing a bullpen game this next time through. And so he might have one fewer day. Uh, it is also like he had dominated Christopher Morrell, who's a very good hitter. And with him coming up with the middle of the lineup coming up. I think a lot of it was just let's not give those guys a third whack at him. Mm -hmm. We have a decent lead. And even though, uh, you know, Bobby Miller had a short start on, on Saturday or Friday, um, th the bullpen wasn't that heavily taxed because they had the day off on Thursday and then none of the key relievers. So they had arms, plus they have Gus Varland. They're getting Connor Brogdon tomorrow, you know, uh, presumably to replace Michael Grove when he gets sent down tomorrow. Uh, they're, they're going to have arms to get through. And I think it was, yeah, I mean, my, my main, the main thing I believe about pitchers is every pitcher's rolling until he's not. And I would rather you take a pitcher out before he gets into trouble than after. Sure. It, yeah. That, that's that, that, especially when Joe Kelly's one of the relievers coming in, you know, I'd rather have Joe Kelly have a fresh inning, you know, and, and when you look at it, you know, Brazier did his job. Like, I think they're looking at parts of the lineup. Here's the four relievers that we're planning on using today, which parts of the lineup do we want each of them pitching to? Yeah. And, and it worked. And so, you know, I, I don't just blindly trust Dave Roberts in these decisions, but, you know, like, like every managerial decision, when it works, he's a genius. And when it doesn't, he's an idiot. Uh, this time it worked. And, you know, but, you know, overall, yeah, I, this early in the season with a guy who's never pitched on every five day schedule, I don't mind limiting him to 80, 80 awesome pitches, letting him leave with his, you know, no runs allowed intact. It, it was a great outing. And yeah. you run the risk setting him out there of, turning it into, you know, leaving on a sour note, you know, let the guy go out on a high note and, and get the win, get the win. Exactly. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I agree with that. And I I'm starting to become comfortable. I'm warming to the philosophy of this is our game plan and we're going to stick with it. And the fact of the matter is that their bullpen is loaded. Their pitching staff is loaded and they have 
infinite numbers of options and it all seems to work. They can mix and match. And, you know, if you can get me five, right, it used to be seven. Now it's five. If you can get me five good innings and he got them five good innings, then we're good with you. You've done your job. Now everyone else has to do their job and that's three outs. And, you know, for the most part, these guys come in and they're comfortable with that. And like, is there an easier job in professional sports than being a middle reliever than being Joe Kelly? Like, How easy is that job? I got to come in and get three outs. I know a few days ago he got roughed up and it was ugly and, you know, he didn't. I was going to say, you've never seen Joe Kelly pitch if you think that's an easy job. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it's easier. <laughs> yeah. It, it, you know, but I mean, those are major league hitters wherever you're coming in, you know, and, and with only, uh, with, with Yamamoto only going five, you know, for sure, somebody's face, two part, two parts of the lineup are getting up twice. And, mm-hmm. and so in this case, it was the middle of the lineup. And so, you know, that there's some tough outs there and, you know, but yeah, I, I don't think it's a coincidence. They gave Joe Kelly the, the bottom of the lineup, uh, to, to get him back on his horse. Uh, you know, but all of that goes into that, that thinking. And I do think, if they go to a six man rotation, when Walker Bueller comes back, I think at that point they will start expecting a hundred pitches or so, at least from, from the starters, because there will be an extra day off built in every time through. Uh, and, and so I think this might've been, you know, really early in the season, you know, we saw it a couple of years ago when people were up in arms because they pulled Clayton Kershaw on a perfect game, uh, which was the right call. And, you know, er- everybody except we'll Twitter, agreed with that. That. <laughs> including Clayton Kershaw, you know, everybody agreed with that. So, you know, uh, early in the season, you're going to you're going to be less aggressive with guys pitch counts. The thing I loved was that he got into a jam in the first inning. And I've, I've been paying attention to all of the Dodgers starters since I started the postcast here on how they have done first time through the first three, the first inning, basically. And Yamamoto like loaded the bases and then struck out the side. And the last two guys looking, I mean, those curveballs were so wicked painting corners. That was fantastic. I was just like, yes. And the people that are like, this guy is a bust and he's overpaid. And I'm like, I don't know that he's going to be good for 12 years, but he's good now. And, and I feel like he's got enough skill with his command of his arsenal of pitches that if one's not working, he's got four or five other options. And today the, the, the four seamer got hammered early in the game, but the curveball was working. I mean, it's just wicked. And his last start, same sort of thing, off speed stuff. He was relying on And Even uh, Eric Carroll during the broadcast was like, do not throw a fastball here. Throw a curveball or some sort of off-speed, you know, splitter, change, whatever, it's cutter, whatever it is uh, that is your out pitch. It, it, that's what we need to rely on because that was working for him. And I thought that was uh, confidence building and fantastic. Yeah, the stuff is ridiculously good. And so, you know, I, I think all of that goes into it of, yeah, let's let this guy have five scoreless innings. That's his entire outing. Boom. That's confidence for the next start because a lot of it is just the confidence of the stuff, trust in the stuff, hitting your spots, all that. And, and it is going to be work in progress because even though he was a star in Japan, he's 25 years old. He's still adjusting to a new league. And the last two starts have been awesome. And I, I think that, uh, you know, I, I think getting him out of there with an awesome start intact yeah, it was a great move, move for yeah. sure all right um so since we have never done this tandem thing before um it's time for me to read my break so do you want to read it with me or you just want to stand there and sit there and watch me read i'm just it? gonna How's sit here and watch you watch you be a good reader for pete <laughs> <laughs> okay cool all right it's time for our first break when we come back uh, i want to talk to jeff about a couple of different things whether or not kike was playing too shallow in center field a couple of times because the ball was hammered over his head <clears throat> Not once, but twice. And I also want to talk about this whole thing with the home run ball for Shohei Otani because it's a big scandal in L.A. and we need to get into it a little bit. We'll do that right after this. Thank you for joining us here on the Locked On Sports L.A. YouTube channel, the place to hang out when every game is done. This is the Locked On Dodgers postcast. Jeff and Vince do the Locked On Dodgers podcast daily, Monday through Friday. You can hear that on the Locked On Dodgers podcast feed. All right. Uh, Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA 
Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, which is not far away, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from another retirement account with a 3% match, which is huge. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal stuff. Claims as of Q1 2024, validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRA for 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood gold for one year. From the date of the first 3% match, must keep Robinhood for five years. The 3% match on transfers is subject to subject to terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA Available to U.S. customers in good standing, Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker dealer. <clears throat> I really wish they had that uh, legal stuff, you know, pre-recorded at like double speed, right, Jeff? So you could just like play it. And make... <laughs> uh, welcome to the, or welcome back to the, uh dodger locked on postcast the place to hang out when every game is done on the locked on sports la youtube channel and you can listen to us on the locked on dodgers podcast feed i am pete fox alongside the locked on dodgers co-host jeff schneider and we're talking about this 4-1 win over the cubs where uh yamamoto looked good and uh kike hernandez started in center field and i thought at times jeff that the two balls that were hit over his head uh, were you know, was Kike and he's fast. Like what happened there? Was he just, was he playing too shallow or were those balls just hammered over his head and rightfully so deserved to be doubles? Yeah. I, I don't know if, if he was too shallow that the fact is Kike is a center fielder. That's always been his weakness is going back. He's very good going to his left and right. He's solid coming in uh, and, and going back on a ball has always been his weakness. Now the, there's, a couple schools of thought about what to do about that, either play deeper. So you don't have to go back as often or play to your strengths and just deal with it when they do hit it over your head. Because part of the reason he's good coming in is that he's positioned well for the ones in front of him, you know? And so I, I do think there's a trade-off and I, I suspect that their scouting report, they didn't expect, you know, dead center balls off the wall, whether, you know, Wrigley wind or whatever yeah, it is, yeah. you know, I, I think it was, you know, in hindsight, it's easy to say who well, is too shallow, uh, but I think it was just as likely that they would have been hitting him in front of him and he would have had to charge on him. And and ultimately, sometimes you just got to tip your hat to the to the hitters hitting it over your head. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Kike in center field is not going to get to a lot of balls over his head. He just does. And like that first one, he got the, he had the range but he went the wrong way, you know, and, and that ball had the hap hit, had a lot of slice to it. And so Kike off the bat, it looked like it was a little bit right of center. And so he turned to his left and ran back and then it sliced. So he ended up, it ended up being the other side. And so he couldn't he, quite reach it. He had this kind of look going on. Yeah. <laughs> where he was just, you know, chasing around. Like, I don't know where this is going to land and hopefully it lands on my glove. And it's but hard it, to tell on TV if that was an, unusual amount of slice that that ball had or if yeah. it you know get, like it's tough to tell but yeah I, I i think it's probably a case of hindsight easy to say you know well just play back when they're going to hit it over there and then play him when they're going to hit it in you know yeah as much as uh you know james outman is a uh friend uh, he's my college buddy's nephew and really I'm, you've never mentioned that before i'm a big fan you know <laughs> hey it's, it's my one connection <laughs> so uh you know he's struggling offensively you cannot criticize james outman's outfield play uh, you can in the postseason, but in, in the regular season, he is very, uh, very, very steady and uh, consistent. So that's one thing that he does bring. And I think it's overlooked and everyone cares about offensive numbers. And at least he's batting over uh, 100, which we can't say for Chris Taylor, who's now down to 56. He may squared one up today, hit it deep to center field, but uh, was a fly out. So I, I just I mean, I like Chris Taylor. And as I've said before, that. I, I because he was an all star and played so well in 2020 and 2021. I, I just give him a pass. I'm like, he's good. He's fine. It's all good. And it doesn't matter really what he does to me. He's kind of, you know, created the relationship, if you will. And, I'm, and he plays I'm good solid. defense. He does. Right. He's very versatile and he's a good guy. So he's not difficult for the locker room and all of that stuff. But 
56. I know there are guys that have yet to get a hit in the major leagues this season, but uh, 56 is a little rough, but I got to give, you know, Dave Roberts credit for running him out there. And, you know, it's kind of like shooters going to shoot and you got to let him go out there and, you know, square one up and get a base hit and get out of this thing. But uh, I don't know when that's going to happen. Hey, real quick, let's get to this whole controversy with the home run ball. Shohei Otani, it's his first home run. Uh, a young lady there with her husband retrieves the ball. A lot of people say she caught the ball. I don't think she caught it. It landed at her feet. She picked it up and it's mine. I got it. Right. So the Dodger security ushers her out very quickly. My wife was watching this game from the kitchen as I was watching it in the living room very intently. And she was like, what happened there? They like issued that lady out or, or ushered her out, you know, with the security. And my wife thought it was like this, negative thing i'm like no 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 she caught the ball and they wanted to protect her and i was like you know she'll give it up more than likely because they'll give her a bunch of stuff so as we were going through the postcast that night people uh craig specifically who's a, a regular viewer here was telling me that they gave her a bat a, a, a jersey and two hats that were autographed and uh i was like that seems pretty fair and then you know you hear the story pop up that she didn't get to meet Otani. She didn't get to talk to her husband. She felt very uncomfortable, like they were pressuring her. Like, if you don't give us the ball, we're not going to authenticate it and say that it's real. And you're going to have nothing other than a Major League Baseball in your hand. So I'm just like, here's another scandal, light scandal, surrounding Shohei Otani. And he's telling everybody he met her. And she's like, I never met him. She was on uh, Fox Sports Radio recently. And she's like, I never met him. So now they're trying to backpedal. And they're like, here's more tickets. Come to a game, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the whole thing is just really crazy. I, there are people saying that ball would have been worth $100,000. I'm saying no chance in hell that ball is worth $100,000. But maybe 10 right? And a bat. And some hats and a jersey worth maybe a couple of thousand at the most. Some people say a thousand. I don't know about this whole thing, but I I feel kind of bad for them. What are your thoughts? You know, there's a lot of different thoughts. This is <laughs> uh, th there's no doubt that the Dodgers didn't handle this great. Um, that like there there's certain things like being separated from your spouse that I just wouldn't have stood for that. I, if I'm yeah, right. if I'm the husband. Or if I'm the person and they're not letting me be my, with my wife saying, Hey, this isn't communist Russia. You know, <laughs> I, I I'm going to, I'm going to talk to my wife about this. This is decisions yeah, yeah. that we make together. So, you know, and, and you know, I, I don't know what, what they mean by they wouldn't let us be together because the fact is like, you can't like, there's only so much they can do, you know, right. yeah, if they yeah. say you can't be together, okay, I'm going home with this baseball then. <laughs> like, um, but you know, I do think there are some misunderstandings here. You know, Otani, th that was definitely a loss in translation. I've talked to a Japanese speaker who, who told me that a lot of times in Japanese, they omit the subject of the sentence when it, uh, and so what Otani said was basically translates to met with the fan and got the ball. Not I met with the fan, but met with the fan. And when when Will the Thrill was translating, he inferred that me I met with the fan when it didn't. You know, it meant mm -hmm. somebody had met with the fan and got the ball. Um, I so so really when you get past that, this controversy doesn't involve Otani at all, other than he hit the ball. Like this, this was okay. somebody, you know, some the way the Dodgers employees or the you know contract, I don't know if there's a security that's like a contract for whoever it is, they handled it poorly. Uh, but I also think there are misunderstandings. You know, the athletic article said this ball had quoted an auction guy saying this would be worth $100,000. It's just not true. It's a lie um, because uh, MLB's authentication rules specific. And, and I guess this goes to the other thing that I was going to say, the misunderstanding. They said that the Dodgers told them, if you leave with the ball, we won't authenticate it for you. I suspect what they were actually told is we cannot authenticate this ball because MLB's mm. rules specifically say this is from an article on MLB.com from several years ago, citing their rules. Alas, not every item can be authenticated because individualized serial numbers, a la the Miguel Cabrera 500 homer ball, are only used for major historical circumstances. Home runs hit into the stands are typically not verifiable unless the ball never leaves the authenticator's line of sight. And like you said, Pete, she picked up the ball off the ground. An authenticator 
cannot say 100% for sure that is the home run ball. It could have been a ball she brought with her, a ball she got in batting practice. You know, it, it it's not like nobody mm -hmm. believes it is. But the whole point of authentication right. is saying 100% for sure we are staking everything on this, our reputation. This And so that ball could not be authenticated, which means, yeah, and then people are saying, well, there's a, there's an Otani foul ball selling for $15,000 up in the Dodgers team store. Yes, it is. It's an authenticated game used Otani, Otani foul ball signed by Otani. This ball is neither authenticated nor signed by, by Otani. And so it's not going to have the value that people think. Um, and so I do think some of this was buyer's remorse. They woke up the next day and saw people saying, you're such an idiot. That ball's worth a hundred thousand bucks. You know, right, right, I right. think there's some of that. But yeah, the Dodgers handled it poorly. I'm glad that they're going to try to make things right. Um, but ultimately, you bought a ticket to a baseball game and you walked out with a bunch of autographed Shohei Otani gear. Like, and a great story, right? Yeah. 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 And, and you know, and, and I said on, on Locked on Dodgers, all I would have asked for in that situation is I want a picture with Otani. And I promise that if I come back tomorrow with an eight by 10 print of this, that he will autograph it for me. So I can have that hanging on our wall. Me and my boys with Shohei mm -hmm. Otani autographed you know so then you know my boys can tell their kids this is when my dad got Shohei Otani's first home run as a Dodger you know like but I know not everybody has the same you know I, I get everybody wants different things um, yeah, but yeah. I, I just I feel like this is a combination of people trying to sensationalize the story by saying it's worth a hundred thousand dollars people misunderstanding what it they can and cannot authenticate and you know hey it's the internet let's have drama yeah, for but sure. The Dodgers I, did handle it poorly. Yeah, and they they have done that before. Uh, I I remember I was telling my wife the story today that back in like I want to say it was ninety seven, ninety eight, maybe in that neighborhood, they had a story where uh, two ladies were kissing during a, you know a, a song in the middle of an inning, and they kicked them out right, and then lo and behold, they backpedaled, and uh, you're like, oh, now they have all the and everyone does. But this is, again, I'm talking 25 years, 26 years ago. You know, the LGBTQ thing was not what it is today. And they handled that poorly. But they, to their credit, backpedaled and said, we made a mistake. And they adjusted and did the right thing. And I'm sure they'll do that here as well. And it, this is, you're right, not as nearly as bad. There's no way that ball is worth $100,000. I said maybe 10. And I joked that Otani's worth millions give the lady 10 grand it'll make her life right uh, and, and people saying well i would have demanded a season season tickets in a suite like they would have said no it's 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 his first home run as a dodger it's not yeah. a milestone it's it's, right it's a memento for him it only yeah. has value to him and people who are insane collectors of his stuff yeah you're right it's not a milestone and that's exactly what i said too it's one home run as a dodger he's going to hit potentially three or 400 more, right? And on how the wind at Wrigley is. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's a lot of bluster, but I, I feel like the message here is if you are in the bleachers or the pavilion and you catch get a the ball on the fly and put it in your pocket and go home and think about it and say, Here's what I would like to do, right? You don't need oh, to you be catch it on the fly and then hold it up so the authentic authenticators can see it the whole time. <laughs> Come put a sticker on this thing. Then you've got negotiating power. Exactly, exactly. It's uh, you know, it requires some skill. Don't get me wrong. Bring your glove. Not, not easy to catch that ball because that was an absolute bomb that he hit. I mean, that ball was ripped, and uh, it was it was not a uh, check swing sort of wind aided home run. I always like bring a first baseman's glove. Bigger, easier to catch home runs. <laughs> <laughs> all right jeff do you want to hang out for the final segment i mean we're, we're rolling along heck here. yeah man let's keep going all right, cool. all right i gotta read two spots here but i'm only gonna read one don't tell hey, better you than me okay uh he, he's jeff snyder host of the co-host of the locked on dodgers podcast i am pete fox host of the locked on dodgers postcast the difference is this jeff and vince monday through friday in the morning give you your daily dose of dodger stuff i come on after the game we break it down and occasionally, uh, Jeff and Vince are going to jump on, which is awesome. I appreciate that. So you can check us out on the Locked On Sports LA YouTube channel and listen on the Locked On Dodgers podcast feed. <laughs> All right, I got to talk about this factor thing here. This is pretty cool because uh, I'm thinking about getting involved in this. My wife and I have recently signed up for a meal plan, which is doesn't involve any food. It just involves the recipe. So you got to, you know, cook it yourself and. Jeff, I don't know about you at your house, but I'm the guy that does the cooking, right? Because uh, my wife has like a real job, 
and I do this. Uh, so I have to cook and clean and all that. So here she's like, here's the recipe and all the food. Let me know when you're ready. And I'm like, okay. And more normally I don't mind that stuff, but a lot of times I'm like, I'm not feeling it. I'm, I'm not in the mood. So one of the cool things about factor is that you don't have to do any cooking. It's eat eating stress-free this spring with factor because they have delicious food and they are ready to eat meals. They send you the food in a box and all you have to do is cook it, all right? It's never frozen and it's chef crafted, dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes. Choose from a weekly menu of 35 options, including popular options like Calorie Smart, Keto, Protein Plus, or Vegan and Veggie. Also discover more than 60 add-ons every week like breakfast, on-the-go lunch, snacks, beverages to help you stay fueled and feel good all day long. Whether you're uh, waiting to get started on your day or in the middle of your day and you need to keep things rolling, uh, Factor has got you covered. They have chef-prepared meals on the table in just two minutes with Factor's ready-to-eat meals so you can get back to what you're doing, what you love this spring. Looking for gourmet meals? They have that as well. Meals that feature premium ingredients like filet mignon, shrimp, truffle butter, broccoli, and asparagus. Factor is your solution for fast Premium meals without the need for cooking. They're celebrating Earth Day all month long. Look out for the Earth Month Eats badge on the menu for their lowest carbon footprint meals. Head to factormeals.com slash locked on MLB50 and use the code locked on MLB50. Get the 50% off on your first box plus 20% off on your next box. That's code locked on MLB50 at factormeals.com slash locked on MLB to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box while your subscription is active. All right, Dodgers get a 4-1 win over the Cubbies to even that series at one. Sad news, though, Jeff, uh, the Dodgers' streak of five run games comes to an end. Uh, I don't know if you were following that streak. I found it fascinating because – the the streaks they were challenging dated back to uh, the early 1900s and into the 1800s when there were four strikes in baseball. There were so many rules that people don't understand and take for granted that it's always been this way, right? And they just figured it out. No, they didn't figure it out. Back in the 1800s, four strikes to get an out. Uh, there was no pitching mound. They couldn't throw overhand. There was all sorts of weird things as they were figuring out this game as it was evolving. So pretty monumental streak to go, uh, I believe it was 10 games with five or more runs to start the season. Uh, the, the record uh, dates back to 1932 when the Yankees had murderers row like Gehrig and Ruth and all those guys. So a pretty big deal for the Dodgers to um, go on that streak and come one run, sh one run shy today, but uh, four won the final in this win over the Cubbies. What, what stood out for you? Uh, Otani with a couple of hits. He's clearly figured it out. As I put in my little, uh, show notes, there is batting average for the first time over 300. Uh, Max Muncy with a couple of hits coming off a three strikeout day. So I feel like Max Muncy is a guy that we're not, we're not afraid. We're not scared. We're not upset if he strikes out a bunch, but he's, you know, he's off to a pretty good start making contact with the ball, getting clutch hits. So I feel really good about that. Mookie Betts 0 for 3, so his average way down to 415. So I don't know. He might need to be benched. Uh, and Freddie Freeman also an 0 for today, 0 for 5. So he's only batting 333. So what stands out to you today uh, in this game from an offensive perspective as, yeah, I loved that. Yeah, I mean, Muncy's hit was huge uh, when, you know, the starter left the game with no runs having been allowed. Uh, two runners on base, and then the reliever comes in, immediately walks Tay Oscar to load the bases, immediately throws a wild pitch to to break the score, <laughs> break up the shutout, and then and then Muncie gets the huge hit. And you know, I, I do have concerns about Muncie gets lefties. Uh, you know, it, at times in his career, he's been really good against lefties. At times, you know, this season he has struggled. He did have a big homer off a of lefty, but like that starter today, like uh, it. It wasn't surprising to see Muncie swinging and missing against guy, that guy, you know? And so I'm sure Muncie was as relieved as anybody to see that guy get pulled. And, you know, that's part of the the point of splitting up, you know, putting Teoscar fourth because they had to pull that guy with runners at scoring position, guys at 100 pitches, and Teoscar's coming up who pounds lefties. Like, they basically mm -hmm. had to pull him, which meant, boom, that, that has a righty for Muncie. Uh, and so, you know, it was a huge hit for him uh, that Austin Barnes had two hits, including – you know, he's, he 
started that rally. He scored the first run of the game. Like if we had a back in the eighties, they had game winning RBIs. If we had a game winning runs, Austin Barnes scored the game winning run, the run that put them ahead for good. And so, you know, Barnesy gets a lot of crap from a lot of people, including the the guy saying this sentence right now. And uh, <laughs> but you know he got two hits, and uh, we'll take it. Uh, I'll take Will Smith in the lineup every day. But when yeah. when he does have to sit, if Barnesy can come in and get a couple hits, uh, that that would be awesome. And and all yes. in all, like it, it was a kind of a team effort because, like you said, Mookie and Freddie were both over, uh, but the other guys, Otani looked great, and the rest of the lineup kind of stepped up. Mr. Seabad, who uh, commented in the chat, uh, Barnes two for four, give him a five-year extension. So, uh, you know, a big fan there. He's batting 500. Can't really complain. You know, he's I suspect Riverside. he's got at least five more months. <laughs> right down the street here from where I am right now. He's a, he's a Riverside guy from SoCal. Uh, one of the uh, the few. I mean, there's they, they've produced a handful of guys. Joe Kelly from the, the IE as well. Uh, I met a lady today at my wife's grandson's birthday party her nephew is lucas duda former met and royal and uh, a couple other teams is duda a socal guy i thought he was a sacramento guy no he's from riverside and oh, uh, went to uh high school here in riverside so i met his aunt today and uh that was pretty cool so, you know he had a decent you should career. introduce her to james outman's uncle <laughs> how dare you <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yeah, good game today. I, I, I it was kind of slow. I mean, the Dodgers really have been uh, on their opponents early lately. And when it's, you know, no score into the, what was it, the fifth inning today? I was like, yeah, hey, what are you going to do here? So they put up three in the fifth. And then, as I've said a few times, uh, I feel like their one run games are the most stress free one run games I've been a part of in a long time. Like, it's like we get a one run lead and that's, pretty much all we need right i, I don't feel like it, there's more although the dodgers continue to struggle with runners in scoring position and they're over nine today i believe before they finally scored after leading the league the last two years with runners in scoring position so i'm like is this a stat that will eventually just fade away and they'll be back to being atop the league but i feel like and, and this is maybe the pessimist in me that's like oh god they leave so many runners stranded but today uh they got it done in spite of leaving at least nine if not more stranded and running in scoring position well here's an interesting stat for you most of the time the best teams in baseball also lead in most runners left on base and that's because they have so many runners if you get two guys on and then you get back to back singles you just scored two runs and you're also going to, and then you leave those two guys on base. Like most, most of the time runners left on base is a function of having a crap load of runners on base. And, and you know, so it doesn't always even out over the course of the game, but even yeah. this one, you talk about the Dodgers put up four runs and won the game despite starting over nine with runners, in scoring position, it, you know, other than 2018, that almost always evens out. 2018 was a weird year where it, like it never seemed to even out until they got to the postseason. Like it's like, they, they were the best hitting team in baseball and yet they barely, you know, barely won the division. Uh, but most of the time that stuff evens out. And, and if you look like it, the, the best teams in baseball always lead in runners left on base because they have so many runners on base to leave there. Yes, indeed. That's well stated. Uh, that's a very good point. It's a, you know, a function of being a team that puts a lot of runners on base. All right. Well, well over the 30 minutes, but that's okay. Uh, I have one more question for you. I was okay. one of our uh, viewers. I think he was a Cubs fan says he lives in Wrigleyville. Have you ever been to a game at Wrigley? I have. I've been to one game back in the summer of 2013, 2012. Okay. Do you remember what month it was? Yeah, it was July okay, or was late, it? late June or early July. Okay. It was so probably 6, warm, degrees. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I made a comment on the postcast yesterday that I've been to Wrigley in May or June. I think I might've said June. I probably misstated myself that I was May. And I remember saying that whole old saying the, the coldest uh, winter I spent was a summer in Chicago, right? That for me held true in that specific point because I was there in, in May or whatever, and I probably wasn't dressed appropriately and I froze my butt off. Uh, because the wind was whipping around there in Wrigley, kind of like it was yesterday. And this guy commented, he's like, uh, your comment about being cold at Wrigley in June or May is completely false. I'm like, how can you say that my opinion about me being cold is false? I was cold, right? It, it, it was cold that day. And it may have been May and not June, because he was like, there's no way it's 50 degrees in June. I'm like, 
really? It's never been 50 degrees at Wrigley in June. I don't think that's fair. I mean, I'm sure we could look that up in the farmer's almanac or something, but I didn't choose to do that. I just choose to share some logic with him. And uh, I don't know if that ever worked, but uh, I was hoping you have been there in May and froze your butt off as well. But evidently you were well. baseball reference has the weather. I just looked up the game. I went to, it was only 75 degrees, but it was humid and it felt like a thousand degrees, especially because I had a, I had a one-year-old baby Uh with us. And so it was, uh, yeah, it it was pretty warm, but uh, luckily the game was only two hours and 20 minutes. All right. Wow. If exactly. you remember when you win, I can find you the weather, but you know, I, I, I'm going to have to dig that up. I could probably zero in on it. Cause I was only in Chicago. I lived there for one year. So I, I went to a fair share of uh, games, but I could zero in on the, the time frame. Unfortunately, I do not remember the opponent, but I do believe it was may and it was probably 2001 may okay. of 2001 pick a pick a pick middle of the month and see what we got oh you know what i was actually wrong i was there the next day and it was 93 degrees that makes more sense it was 93 <laughs> degrees the day i was there it was 75, 75 one, day, one day 93 the next day yeah i i was off by one day and i was definitely off i, right, I pick I, a middle of the month may 2001 and see what we get all right let's see random month i don't i, I don't have any cubs of the uh of the opponent might have been the May when they were at home uh they played the brewers in late may may 25th and 27th oh with that that sounds right that sounds right let's see may 25th uh it was what sorry i clicked the wrong link here we go this is enthralling listening if you're listening on the (laughs) podcast uh may 25th 61 degrees seven mile an hour wind yeah that okay. that's uh that's pretty chilly. It felt uh, worse. <laughs> the next one, uh, fifty eight degrees. A couple days later, and thirteen mile an hour wind. Okay, was it yeah. a Sunday or Friday? Do you remember? Oh God. Uh, you know, yes, it was one of those. <laughs> as I look out my window, as we're talking here, and it's snowing where I am right now. So uh, beautiful. Yeah, and you're in Utah, so yeah. uh, we had some snow not far from here in SoCal, up in the mountains. It's been dumping the last few days, so uh, I'm trying to get up there to do some skiing with my daughter. Jeff, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for doing this. Hopefully we can do it again. I know that uh, your weekend is your off time, uh, but this has been a blast. Uh, Dodgers was a 4-1 win, and uh, you'll be back at it again Monday morning. So you guys bang it out on Sunday night and get it out there Monday morning, right? Yeah, yeah. In fact, late Sunday night, really, it's usually up. It's, you know, especially with the game being a day game, we'll probably have it up by about 9 or 10 p.m. Pacific on, cool. on Sunday night. So. I will not do the game tomorrow because I have Clippers. Uh, they have a big one against Cleveland, I believe, tomorrow. So I have to do that game. And they both start right around noon, 1 o'clock. So I'll be doing Clippers tomorrow. But then back. I hope Dodgers. Brad Doherty has a big game. Is he still <laughs> on the Cavs? No, he's too busy shaving his sideburns. You I'm know, a big so. basketball guy. <laughs> <laughs> Brad Doherty. That is, what is that, 20 years ago? <laughs> I mean, Something like that so uh anyways you'll join these guys uh tomorrow after the game uh they will be uh, on locked on dodgers podcast feed and the locked on sports la youtube channel as well and then i'll be back at it uh, are they off monday or when do they when do they play is they it don't a- have a day off till thursday so they okay, take, so. start against the twins on monday right uh right back at it on monday against the twins i will join you then he's jeff snyder you can find him on the locked on dodgers podcast feed and i am pete fox this is the locked on dodgers postcast thank you Thanks, Jeff. It was a pleasure. Thanks for joining us. And uh, we will talk again on Monday.